All right, guys, go ahead and grab your bifold and turn your Bibles open to James chapter 1. James opens his book, his letter, his epistle by saying, James, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Now, there's a lot of things James could have said to introduce himself, right? He could have said, Hi, I'm James. I'm the head pastor of the Jerusalem church. Hey, I'm James. <laughs> I mentor Paul and I mentor Peter. Hey, I'm James. Mary's my mom. I'm the half-brother of Jesus. But it doesn't say any of that. It doesn't mention a thing about it. Why? Because who he is and what he realizes after meeting his brother face to face is what he really is as a bondservant, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And guys, I paused at this first verse for a while because I, and I asked myself, if COVID would have taken my company out and I would no longer have on my business card the CEO of Alliance Flooring, right? Would that have changed who I am? If it was my wife who passed instead of her best friend, Pam, would that have changed who I am? If I lose my family somehow in a tragic accident, would that change who I am? All those things would, would be horrible, obviously. But what James takes us to is what the film just underscored. Who are you? Who are you? What James says, I'll tell you who I am. I'm a follower of Christ. I'm his slave. I'm his bondservant. God's number one in my life. Greetings. We tend to measure ourselves and introduce ourselves and even want to know something about somebody else by what they do for a living, right? What, is it, what do you do? <laughs> my wife would come back, hey, meet somebody new in the subdivision. What does that guy do? <laughs> As if that defines him, right? We're not defined by what we do. We're not defined by what we own. We're not defined by, by how much money we have or how much we've socked away. What we're really defined of by the answer, who is God to you? That's what defines us. That's what's the most important thing, and that's where James goes. And then I love where he goes from there. He starts out, and James is a straight-up, tell-it-like-it-is guy, and he's speaking to an exciting time but a very challenging time, and he goes right to the worst day we could possibly have, a horrible day, a day when things aren't working out, a day when there's confusion and trouble and the wind's blowing in our face, and he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you, incur, when you encounter trials of many kinds, why? Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. For what result? Allow perseverance to finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. This is not common thinking, right? So let's start out with that first statement, pure joy. What is pure joy? Okay, I know what happiness is, right? The Braves beat the Yankees. That made me happy. <laughs> Finally, wow! <laughs> Ryan signed up a new store in Illinois last week. That made me happy. Our company's growing. I've been looking for a new business car. Mine was, I don't know, I guess it was six or seven years old. So I was kind of been looking around for a while. I found it. I found the right deal. I took it to my wife. I said, what do you think? She gave me the thumbs up. I drove off, and I was happy behind that wheel. I felt good to have this new car. That's not joy, right? What's, what he's saying is, he's, Paul is not saying be happy when you have trials. It's not logical. We don't wish that on ourselves or our friends or our loved ones. But he, what he's saying is have pure joy when you experience trials. Now, what, how do we wrap our minds around that? Well, let's talk about what pure joy is first. So I pulled a past, uh, verse there from Psalm 16, verse 11. It tells us what pure joy is. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence, presence, presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. I can tell you this. Five years ago, when I was told to get my affairs in order, I had an, I had an impossible situation. 
Somehow, in the midst of that, I found pure joy. Before going into the operating room, I had pure joy. And the reason I did is because after Ryan came over and we listened to Oceans Together and Ball Like Babies, <laughs> and I got quiet before God, and I had a lot of guys who are in this room praying over me, I had total peace because I was in the presence of the Lord and I knew whatever was going to happen was his. And it was a joy and a blanket that I can't even explain to you. Sometimes I wish I could have that every single day. <laughs> but it seems to escape us because of how life goes. But what the psalmist is telling us in the presence of the Lord is pure joy. So the only way that we can follow up this first directive that, Paul, that, that James gives us which is when you have trials, consider it pure joy, is by being in the presence of God and understanding from his throne room coming down to us who he loves that he's doing something with us. He's forming something. as He sees something that needs to be corrected, <laughs> needs to be adjusted. So he's going to put us through a situation so that we can learn some perseverance and so that we can be made mature and whole and complete. Looking back at things that I've gone through in my life that are extremely tough, and we all could probably stop and go to the tables right now, and we'd fill up the rest of the night just sharing with each other tough things that we've gone through, but what we learned from those times, right? We learn much more during difficult times than we do when the wind's at our back and everything's going well. And our Heavenly Father, who's preparing us for when we are in heaven and preparing us for our assignment, whatever that's going to be, and preparing it to meet with him is chiseling us and forming us, and he's going to put us through things. And because he loves us and because he has a plan for us and he sees what we can be versus the comfortable place that we sometimes want to rescind to and fall down to, he's going to pull us up and he's going to put us through things so that we can mature and become everything that he wants us to be. So because of that, when you're going through a test and you're going through a hard time, you can have pure joy because you know your loving Heavenly Father loves us more than we can ever even think and imagine is putting us through a test so that we can mature and we can grow and so you can have that. Now, it's a lot easier three years later to look back on that. Can we learn this so that we can realize when we're in the middle of it, what are you doing, God? So he hits that. He says... If you don't know what to do, the very next verse, go down there, James 1, 5 through 6. What's up? <laughs> Why are we going through this? He says, now, if any of you lacks wisdom, I don't get it. Why am I going through this? He should ask God. Who gives generously to all without finding fault. So, James, Nick, one of James' nicknames, all right, I would probably, if I see him, I may at some point when we get to know each other, call him the king of one-liners, right? You know what his nickname was when he was walking around? Camel knees. You know why they called him camel knees? Because he was constantly on his knees and they were all, because of the amount of time he was in prayer, his knees were all wrinkled up from being on his knees for so long. Now, where do you think he learned that from? When Jesus started his ministry, if you read the life of Jesus, when he called his disciples and he went to Capernaum and he, and he healed Peter's mom, then he disappeared the next morning. And the disciples were looking for him. The crowd was starting to gather. He's like, they found him. They interrupted his prayer and said, Jesus, what are you doing? <laughs> we got a momentum going. We got a whole bunch of people that... And Jesus had found a quiet place to pray. That was not something that Jesus started at age 30 when he started his ministry. That was Jesus' life. From 12 years old on, at least, Jesus made a prayer a part of his life, and James knew that about his brother. And after he met his brother, and he got changed, he mimicked his big brother. And so one of the things he tells us right out of the gate, if you lack wisdom, ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to him. Let me ask you something. Do you have a bench? Do you have a room? Do you have a place in your house that you go to meet with God daily, regularly? Do you realize the value of that? I can tell you that I get in places and in meetings and in situations that there is no way I could handle them if I didn't have my time on the bench that day. 
God will meet us on our bench and give us wisdom and give us power for living and conviction that can come from nowhere else except by taking out the time to develop your relationship with him. Slow your day down and realize we have access to the creator of the world. He gives us access through his son. Why would we not take advantage of that? Why would we not make it a priority? Why would that not be the most important part of your day? A chance to take everything and put it before our loving Father. And when you don't get it, you say, God, I don't get it. Why is life so hard right now? Why is the wind always at my face? Lord, thank you, God. <laughs> Everything just seems to be in place right now. Thank you for this little bit of respite that I have right now. I know there's another lesson coming. I know I've got something else to get chiseled. When that day comes, help me to realize what's going on. Help me. Do you have that kind of relationship? Are you having those type of discussions? Everybody agrees we should. Jesus lived it. James lived it. Do you live it? Are you walking out what we're talking about that's what James wants to know. Are you living out your faith? Is it a part of your everyday life? Have you developed your theology and what you really believe? Is this an important part of it? Fellowship, one-on-one, -on -one, your relationship with God, what's really true, what really matters to you, not what somebody sees, not how you can... Act when you're around certain people in certain times. Who are you really at home? What are you prioritizing? I can actually watch Fox News if I've been on the bench that day. If I don't, I want to know what's going on in the world. <laughs> so crazy, I can't watch it, right? I know who's on the throne. If you ask, it'll be given to you, but we, he must ask in faith without doubting because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea Blown and tossed by the wind. You ever feel that way? What James is talking about is the principle of the slingshot. Everybody knows what a slingshot's for, right? If I want to take something and I want to pinpoint it against that back door, give me a slingshot, give me a rock, I can take it and stretch it back, and I can launch it where it wants to be. What I propose to you is that our launch is in our stretch. God knows where he wants to send you. God knows what he has planned for you. In order for you to get there, he's going to have to stretch you. <laughs> he's going to have to take us through a time when we get stretched so that he can launch us to where he wants to go. So what we want to do is, number one, realize that that's a fact and realize that what we're going through is part of that reason because God is on the throne and he has actually he loves us enough and knows us enough and has an individual plan for us that he will take the time to put us through things to stretch us so that, so that we can be launched. And then James goes on and saying, oh yeah, and by the way, when you get stretched, the tendency is going to be to say, all right, I'm being stretched, but that's okay because I got this over here or I got this over here I can fall back on. I can go to my comfort I can do whatever I've created in my life to have a comfortable life here, that I can ignore that for a period of time and just concentrate on this over here, distract myself, whether it's sports or whether it's my second home or my luxury or whatever it is that I do to get myself off of that and forget that and just come over here. No, 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 no. You're going to come back to it. If you work your way around what God's trying to get you through, I, it, I'm telling you, I went through some things four times because I didn't catch it. I can figure out how to get around the wall. I can distract myself from that, forget that. God's going to bring me right back to it because I didn't learn it. We put too much pain on ourselves. Ask God for wisdom. Find out what it is you're going to need. Learn it the first time. Don't flunk third grade, right? <laughs> Let's learn what we have to learn. Be deliberate about our relationship and what it is that God's trying to teach us. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and its flowers fall off and beauty appearance is destroyed, so too the rich man in the midst of the pursuits will fade away. What we have to realize is all this stuff that we distract ourselves to, like that's going to be gone. 
just like your grass when it's not watered. Here and gone just like that. Everything that we have, there's nothing wrong. And James nowhere says there's anything wrong with riches. But he says it don't take comfort in them. And you just realize it's temporary. <laughs> What's more important is who are you? How do you answer that question? Who am I? How are you growing with him? All right, let's go to the next one. Here's the great promise that he gives us. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. What he's doing is he's moving us toward eternity. We're living here for a short period of time. Eternity is forever. What we do here plays into what happens there. How we mature here makes a difference in how we enter there. So therefore, we want to embrace the lessons that we learn and realize that we have a promise, a crown of life to those who love him. It says, when you're tempted, go ahead and turn the second page of your bifold. James transitions and says, okay, have pure joy when you have trials. Now, how about when you're tempted? Interesting, it's the exact same Greek word. It's parasimus. The same word is used for when we are tested and when we are tempted. He says, first of all, let no man say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Have you ever found yourself in a position where you're doing something that you know you probably shouldn't do, but you're doing it because your desire has led you there and you really want to do it, but you know you shouldn't do it, and you end up putting it on God and say, well, obviously he wants me to do this, or else I wouldn't be in this position right now, right? <laughs> Paul's calling out and says, no, 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 no. God does not tempt anyone. And then he goes, so, so let's talk for a second. What's the difference? Go, I left two blanks there. There's two types of tests, right? You can be, number one, write down, to prove strong. You can be tested to prove how strong you are. That's what God does. He puts us through trials to strengthen us or to show our strength. Number two, to prove you're weak. God never does that. That's what we're told. God will never put us through a temptation to prove that we're weak. Satan does that. So my analogy is I'm in the flooring business. When a new product comes out, when I moved to Atlanta, I was VP of sales at Mohawk. When a new product came out, we would test that product. And then we'd take a competitor's product that was similar and we would test that. Two totally different tests. We would test our product to show how good it is, how strong it is, and tell the consumer, this is what it can do. You can walk on it. We put it under traffic of 20,000 people. It still stood the test. It didn't untwist. You can, put, you can spill Coca-Cola on it, it'll clean out. Then we go to the, the competitor's product, and we would do everything we can to break it down to show how weak it was. So we could say, their product doesn't hold up. God's over here. Putting us through trials to strengthen us. Satan's over here tempting us to break us down. That's the difference between the two dynamics. So go to the next slide. Here's a space of a one spot in the Bible where James breaks down for us the anatomy of sin. What happens when we sin? It's on the second page, James 1, 14 through 15. Each of you, each one of you is tempted by his own evil desires. It starts with something that we want. He is lured away and enticed. And then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings him to death. Guys, when, we're, when we find ourselves on the wrong side of what we should be doing, what we need to realize, as James breaks down for us, it starts with our desire. That's a checkpoint for us. And then that desire, when it's conceived, when we do something with it, it develops into sin. And then when we continue with it, when sin has become full grown, it'll overtake us and it'll kill us. And he uses a fishing term, right? He talks about being lured and being enticed. So let's for a second, consider a fish. Let's consider a bass. Here's the fish, 
Right now, his desires are starting to grow, right? It's feeding time. He's hungry. He wants something. The fisherman comes along and says, all right, I can develop one of any number of things that could lure that fish so that he gets onto my bait, right? And so let's go fishing. Let's study what time the fishes are hungry. My grandson used to come over to our house and fish. He would go online and figure out, oh, okay, the fish and feeding time is between 6 and 7 in the morning. I'll be there at 545. Let's go fishing, right? Or no, tomorrow is not until 9 o'clock. Somehow people have figured this out. There's books on it, right? It's best bass fishing lures and how to catch fish. And how to, let me ask you something. Do you think that any of our soul doesn't know us well enough to develop the lure that's going to catch you? Which one of those things he can catch you with? You think a book hasn't been written by Satan and the demons throughout mankind's history because a lot of this stuff repeats itself? And what happens? So... What's next? The fish is caught. What's the next thing that happened? The fish is sliced down the middle, deboned, fried, and eaten. What do you think Satan wants to do to us? He's out to slice us, dice us, kill us. We're told he's out to rob, kill, and destroy everything that we're about. Here's what I've noticed in life. When does this come? God's over here testing us for strength. We're being stretched. Satan's over here trying to tempt us and bring us down. I'm going to tell you the biggest temptations I've had in my life is at the back of that stretch. I get stretched to here. I'm looking for a way out. So I turn my head sideways. That'll give me some relief. That'll give me some relief. We have an enemy that's putting a lure out to you. Right when you're at the place where God's trying to teach you something and he wants to launch you, he's going to take you over here to something that's going to take you off of here. Guys, if you're turning to alcohol when things get rough, realize who's doing that. God's trying to teach you something. You're trying to numb yourself over here. If you're turning on the computer... (laughs) to get an adrenaline rush from the images that you're looking online because you're in the stretch and the day is hard, you just can't take it. Who do you think is doing that? And what's his purpose? To slice you down the middle. What James is telling us is take this stuff serious. If you say that you're going to follow Christ, if you say he's your Lord, if you say he's your Savior, stay away from that stuff. Let God do his perfect work in you so you can be launched and you become all that he wants you to be. Life is short. We have so much opportunity. He prepares things for us in our life that we can walk in them. But we can't when we're compromised. We can't when we're trying to figure out the stretch and how to give ourselves some relief that is not in his plan. So what happens? What changes when we sin? Here's a verse. I didn't get it when I first read it. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, with whom there is no change or shifting shadow. What does that mean? It's dark outside. It wasn't when we got here. It was light outside. What changed? The sun didn't move. We did. The earth is turning on its axis. What James is telling us, if you find yourself in darkness, realize this. God didn't move. You did. You moved away. God has no shifting shadow. If you moved, it's because if you're in darkness, because you moved away from him. So what do you do at that point? Confess your sin. He's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. Don't mess it up. Don't compromise. Be a man who wants to live life to glorify our Heavenly Father. The most glorifying thing that James could have said in the first verse was, I'm a bond servant of God. That's who I am. I'm not here to tell you anything about me, anything that's great about me. I'm here to tell you I have a God who's worthy for me to be his slave. 
And I want to bring glory to him with my life. All right. I love, um, those of you who know me know that I love Farside, right? So <laughs> here's the guy, the smallest head in the room, right? He says, Mr. Osborne, you know, I'd be excused. My brain is full. <laughs> so I get to this point in James, I say, all right, man, let's, we just went through a lot. Who's James and, and, and you know, what should we, how, how should I look at temptation and how should I look at testing and whatever? But James doesn't stop and he's on a roll. So we're going to stay on a roll. We're going to close out tonight with just a handful of things that he's given us some very practical insights on how to live our lives. So go ahead and look at the last page, um, the third page on your, on your fold out. James 1, 19 through 20. My beloved brothers, understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for man's anger does not bring about the righteousness that God desires. How many of us do the opposite, right? Slow to listen, quick to speak, quick to anger. That's how most guys operate. Do you? Or are you quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, because that will bring about the righteousness of God. That's what James is saying. You want your religion, your relationship to him to be useful. Be slow to speak. Be quick to listen. Be slow to anger. Verse 21, somehow I neglected to put it on the sheet. Let me read it to you. It says, therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness in humility, receive the word implanted which is able to save your soul. Put aside filthiness. When I say that, does anything in your life come to mind? Put aside filthiness. Does anything come to mind? If it does, let me encourage you, before your head hits the pillow tonight, take that to God. Say, God, I don't know what I've been thinking I don't know what I've been chasing. Forgive me. I haven't been looking to you. I know you're doing a work in me. I keep working around you. Help me get rid of this filthiness. Take it out of my life. Give me a new desire in my heart that I don't desire that anymore. He will do it. He gives us the Holy Spirit to actually change our desires so that we want to follow him so that our life can glorify him. We can't do it on our own. I tried. I had some wicked things. I mean, I had a couple of things that got me. I think every guy has three things. I do. I'm <laughs> just talking to guys. I think every guy can name three things. This is what takes me down. And I keep coming back to it. And I would try, and I would try, and I would try. And it would work for a while. And then it would come and get me again. And then it would come and get me again. And finally, I realized, I'm trying to do it on my own, I can't. Jesus said, I have to leave, but I got good news for you. I'm sending you a helper. The helper will change your desire so you no longer want it and it will change your activity. Start by confessing your sin, asking him to cleanse you from it, asking you to change your desire and watch your life change. Those around you will say, whoa, what's different with you? Because when you're hiding filthiness, you may think you're hiding it. People around you know, you ain't right. I'll tell you who really knew, my wife. I don't know if she's really the Holy Spirit, but <laughs> sometimes I think so. I can't hide anything from her. She knows by the look at my face. <laughs> Thank God for people like that in our lives, right? All right. Let's go to James 1.26. Here's really the theme. I mean, this, again, this is part of the theme verse that comes out from James. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his heart, and his religion is worthless. We've talked about that. Dan's going to be unpacking that a little bit more tomorrow morning. It's a big, big theme in chapter 3. We've got to pay attention to our tongue. We absolutely have to pay attention to our tongue. Mark's been doing some work for me, and uh, he, he, a couple times I'll notice Mark, he will, he'll be ready to say something, and he'll stop. You know what he'll say? Right here. Is it true? 
Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? Ron, forget what I, I, I'm not going to tell you what I was going to tell you. We got a lot of guys in this room who are athletes, who are compete, and there's you know guys we jostle, right? I tend to go there too much. My wife will bust me on it sometimes because I can say some things, but then I let it. But in, you know, joking around, there's nothing wrong with that. But then sometimes when I'm frustrated with somebody, then that comes out even more, and then I, now I mean it. But I honed a skill over here that I use over here when I'm frustrated. What James is saying, if we can't bridle our tongue, then who are we? This is a powerful, powerful tool to inspire or to tear down. If we're using it to tear down, if out of the same mouth comes blessings and cursings, then we have to say, is my religion even worth anything? Is it making any difference? You can destroy your testimony in two sentences with somebody. Don't make it useless. It's a very practical thing to do. Think. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? Try that on for a while. I've tried that on the last three weeks. I've stopped myself in a conversation many, many times. And I apologized to my son yesterday one time on the phone because I said something. I said, you know what? I shouldn't have said that because <laughs> I realized that I didn't, I didn't follow that. James is saying, clean it up. Clean up your mouth. Pure and undefiled religion, James 1.27, before our God and Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Do you see the contrast? In verse 26, he's saying, I'm going to tell you what pure religion isn't. What pure religion isn't is you running your mouth. If you can't, if you can't control the flap, <laughs> your religion's not pure. But let me tell you what pure religion is. Given to somebody who can't give anything back to you. You go help an orphan and you go help a widow, there's nothing they can do back for you. You want to show that you have pure, give to people who can do nothing for you. You're not doing it for attention. You're not doing it because of what they can do back. You're doing it because you have a heart to help other people the same way God has a heart to help you. And then he concludes by saying, keep yourself from being polluted by the world. What does that mean? Are you polluted by the world? As I chewed on that, I asked myself, what am I in love with here? That maybe is a little bit out of whack. That maybe has me a little bit polluted. God says we love the world. The love of the Father is not in us. <laughs> it's an interesting dynamic. It's because we're temporal. It's a balance. I mean, it's, it, we're temporal. This is what we see. This is what we live. And God's invisible and we you know we have to slow ourselves down to talk to him and he will make ourselves known to us and his words alive and every you know anybody that's in the word knows that but this world is powerful and enticing and there's so many things that can pull us james is calling us to ask ourselves if we in any way allowed ourselves to be polluted by this world where something here is more important than our relationship with him Something here might be more important than what he's called us to do and how he's called us to live. Don't allow yourself to get there. That's what James is telling us in one of his directives, right? As he keeps hitting us with directive after directive after directive. We started out by showing a film of who you are. Interestingly, Paul has the exact same theme in his writings. Now, consider Paul. I, I, I think the two biggest conversions in the New Testament are Paul, when he got knocked off that horse, right? Good guy, religious guy, convinced that he was serving God by killing Christians. And then he's on a horse on the way to Damascus, and Jesus knocks him off the horse. And he said, and he calls him to the right team. And Paul was like, for the first time, real, saw and realized he was wrong. 
He was so dedicated and thought he was doing so right, and he realized he missed the whole thing. And what does Jesus do to him? Jesus takes him for three years and trains Paul in the desert, personally trained by Jesus. And what's a big theme that Paul writes about? Our identity. Who are we because of our relationship? And how has that changed us? Here's an take, take home assignment. Ephesians chapter 1. Let me encourage you to go to Ephesians chapter 1. Spend some time on your bench. Start out by underlining everything that it says in Ephesians chapter 1 about who we are in him. What is our new identity because of our relationship with him? And then ask yourself, do you see yourself that way? Do you realize that this is how God sees you? So the clip we show from Overcomer, that's part of the theme of that movie. And there's a young lady who she's, who is being tutored, who went to Ephesians chapter one. And as a result of that, she comes back to school and she shares who you are. So I'm gonna close by showing you that clip. And then Tim and the guys will come back up and we'll have a little bit of worship. Ryan will tell, tell us where we're going the rest of the night and tomorrow, okay? Thank you guys.